back for episode 2.1. Our episode begins at the tournament for Joffrey's name day. Now in the book, the Hound actually complains that this tournament is kind of pathetic because most of the great fighters are off in the war. Nonetheless, Lothar Brune faces off against Dantos Hollard. It should be noted that both of these men are Littlefinger's cronies, or at least become Littlefinger's cronies. Joffrey's name day tournament seems to be the beginning of Littlefinger's plan to kidnap Sansa. So Sir Dantos comes out drunk, and in the book he doesn't have his pants on and his dick is flapping around. We never find out how he got in this predicament, but the presence of Lothar Brune makes it seem like a setup. Sir Dantos has a very interesting background. He is the last Darklin. They were the kings of Duskendale. However, the Lord of Duskendale kidnapped King Ares for some reason, and their house was extinguished except for Dantos. So it's very interesting that this man, who comes from a family famous for kidnapping, ends up becoming a kidnapper. So as expected, Joffrey wants to execute Dantos, but Sansa says he can't because it's his name day, and that would be bad luck. Of course, this is complete bullshit, but the Hound supports her. Now what's interesting is that in the book, Tommen actually performs in this tournament. He jousts against a straw man, but it's still seen as courageous. In the book, he's also not chewing gum. Next we meet the small council. Now remember, Pycelle is pretty loyal to the Lannisters, and Janus Slint is Littlefinger's man. The second book is very much about how Varys uses Tyrion to settle the score. Tyrion arrives and very quickly assesses the situation in King's Landing. In the book, we are bombarded with a lot of information. Cersei didn't kill Ned, or Jon Arryn. Varys dismissed Barristan Selmy, and Janice Slint is Littlefinger's man. Plots within plots within plots. Now in the book, Tyrion actually brings with him a bunch of mountain tribesmen to protect him, and it somewhat explains why Tyrion doesn't find himself dead. Up in Winterfell, Bran is learning how to be a lord. Bran's plot is really the first to move heavily away from the books. In the books, Bran is dealing with the fact that he's becoming more and more antisocial. Big and little Walder Frey have joined them at Winterfell, and Bran hates them. In part, it's because they're dicks, but it's mostly due to the fact that they like physical activities. Rickon, though, loves them. However, once when playing, Rickon's wolf Shaggy Dog attacks the Frey boys. After this, the wolves are sequestered in the Godswood. And Bran cannot sleep, in part because of the Three-Eyed Crow, and in part because of the Howling Wolves. So Lewin gives Bran something called Sweet Sleep. The drug blocks out the Three-Eyed Crow, but it enhances his connection to Summer. Now next we see the Comet, which plays a much larger role in the book. Yes, everybody has their own interpretation on what it means, but it's also one of the few times in the story where we know all of the events are happening at roughly the same time. News can take a long time to spread across the kingdom, especially with regards to Daenerys. And in the book, George R. R. Martin specifically says that some of the chapters aren't chronological. But the comet aligns certain things. We know that Daenerys and Arya, for instance, lost their hair within days of each other, or that Ned and Miri Mazdor were executed at roughly the same time. The comet may also be enhancing the powers of people on the planet. George R. R. Martin has written other stories about celestial objects being special. This comet may not be just a hunk of ice. It may be magical, or a spaceship, or an alien. Our author has specifically written about the latter too. Now in the book, Danny specifically follows the comet into the Red Waste. But in the show, they simply walk the only direction afforded to them. Now here we see the dragons aren't eating. This is also a problem in the book, but in the book, Danny remembers that Viserys specifically tells her that dragons eat cooked flesh. Quite often, the stories of Viserys drive Daenerys' actions, at least in the book. But here, show Daenerys dismisses Viserys as a moron. Now, Daria remains alive in this scene. In the book, she mysteriously dies of something kind of similar to radiation poisoning. Her hair falls out and she gets weird blood blisters and sores. I'm not sure what killed her, but I do suspect that Jorah is the one that murdered her. Daria was a creature of Illyrio, and Jorah is beginning to change his attitude about things at this point. So while Daria has remained alive, the show has killed off Danny's horse. As of the beginning of The Winds of Winter, Danny's horse is still alive and is being ridden by Barristan Selmy. Now in the book, Danny discovers an oasis village called Vase Toloro. It's completely abandoned, but Danny considers settling there. But then she has another weird dragon dream and sends out her blood riders to find a way out of the red waste. And here in the show, she is sending out her blood riders to do the same. Meanwhile, north of the wall, the crew has made it to Craster's Keep, where they find out he's been marrying his daughters. But where are his sons? Dun dun dun. Now Mormont asks Craster if he's seen Benjen Stark. He hasn't seen him in three years. This is astoundingly weird. Craster is a friend of the Watch, and rangers stop at his place for help. Why was Benjen avoiding Craster? Because he didn't agree with Craster's practices? It should be noted that all of the rangers, including Benjen, know about Craster's sacrifices. 
And yet the ranger that tells Mormont isn't Benjen, it's Thorin Smallwood. So Thorin went above his commanding officer to tell the Lord Commander. If Benjen disagreed with the practice, why didn't he tell the Lord Commander? Now Craster in the show says that Benjen Stark treated him like crap. In the book, it's Waymar Royce that treats him like crap. Waymar is the guy that died in the first scene of the show. This kind of makes sense because Waymar was new to the watch. He wasn't used to the practices of Craster. So Craster is introduced to John, and what's missing is that in the book, he recognizes him as a Stark. Although Craster claims that Benjen hasn't been around in years, he can look at John's face and know he's kin to Benjen. Meanwhile on Dragonstone, Melisandre is burning the Gods of the Seven. Now you may be wondering how she's getting away with such a sacrilegious action. As it turns out, at this point of his campaign, Stannis' followers are almost all Valyrians. You see, House Targaryen was not the only house to survive the Doom of Valyria. There was also House Valarian and House Celtigar, and their history with the Faith of the Seven doesn't go back very far. Interestingly, Stannis' other supporters are the Lysene Pirates. The Lysene have strong Valyrian blood, and Saladar Sand's ship is even called Valyrian. And so next we get to meet Maester Cresson. Now, although the Maesters of the Citadel claim to be neutral, they definitely have an agenda. It seems very clear that before Robert's Rebellion, the Maesters were trying to marry off various High Lords to each other. According to Lady Dustin, a Maester tried to control Rickard Stark's marriage ideas. Brandon would be married to a Tully, Lyanna to a Baratheon, and Ned and Robert would be fostered with the Arryns. This would form the stark tully baratheon Arryn alliance, the basis of Robert's rebellion. Now in the book, Cresson pushes this alliance again on Stannis. Peace with Renly he pushes, peace with Rob Stark he pushes, a marriage between Sweet Robin and Shireen he pushes. Stannis nearly agrees to the last one, but in the end Queen Selyse shoots it down. It should be noted that Cresson is effectively Stannis and Renly's dad. Stefan Baratheon died when Stannis was in his early teens and when Renly was a baby. Maester Cresson raised them and loves them, and it breaks his heart that Melisandre is driving his sons to kill each other. Now we get this shot of Lightbringer. Now Melisandre may be a big fraud in many ways, but she does have the ability to glamour things. Lightbringer in the book is a glowing, flaming sword, although it gives off no heat. It remains a mystery how she pulled this trick off. Now here we see Maester Pylos. Since Cresson is old, Maester Pylos is Cresson's replacement. However, Stannis doesn't trust him and doesn't confide in him like he does with Cresson. So Pylos is in need of gaining Stannis' trust. This is important. Cresson plans on killing Melisandre, and he's a bit sloppy about this. He actually takes the poison out in his room, puts it on the table, and then takes a nap. Of course, Pylos lives in chambers right next to Crescent, and he takes care of him. In fact, he was supposed to wake him up for this meeting. So it seems pretty damn likely that Maester Pylos went into Crescent's chamber and saw the poison. So what would a maester that wants to be trusted do? Tell Stannis and Melisandre, perhaps even provide an antidote to them. The point being, Melisandre surviving this poison is not black magic. Interestingly, this is the same poison that kills Joffrey. It's called the Strangler. Now we're treated to this extra scene between Jamie and Rob, which is essentially a pissing contest. Rob has been taking Jamie around with him because he doesn't trust his vassals with him. In the book, Jamie spends his time in the dungeons of Riverrun under the guard of Edmure Tully. And we're treated to this extra scene between Shay and Tyrion. In the book, Tyrion is much more careful with Shay. He's keeping her in outside of the Red Keep. But naturally, Varys finds her almost immediately. And then we're treated to this very peculiar and hostile scene between Littlefinger and Cersei. They talk about power, and then Cersei, to prove a point, almost kills Littlefinger. Keep in mind, in the book, everyone finds Littlefinger indisposable. Cersei believes he saved her from Ned's coup. He controls the gold cloaks, and everyone thinks he's a genius with money. Even Tyrion, who really, really hates Littlefinger because of the dagger incident, feels he can't do anything because Littlefinger is too valuable. In the next scene, Rob is sending his terms to King's Landing through his chosen emissary, Alton Lannister. In the books, Alton Lannister is called Cleos Frey. Cleos is half Lannister and half Frey, but decided to side with the Lannisters in the war. He's actually not that bad, but everyone treats him poorly because he's a Frey. And I do feel bad for the guy. He's sent on four trips between River Run and King's Landing, and each time he's given horrible terms that he knows are going to be rejected. Ah well, poor Sir Cleos. So next we're treated to this extra scene where Theon convinces Rob that he should be sent to the Iron Isles. Rob needs ships and the Ironborn have them. In exchange for their help, they would receive Independence and Casterly Rock. It's a pretty sweet deal for the Ironborn. The Ironborn are big miners. Controlling the Lannister mines would change everything. 
Now Catalan thinks this is a horrible idea. Theon was the Stark's ward, and without Theon, nothing is keeping the Ironborn from attacking the North. Very rarely are our point of view characters actually correct about things, but Catalan is right on the money on this one. Rob, though, fully trusts Theon and ignores Catalan's advice. However, it's not just Catalan that doesn't trust Theon. One of Rob's vassals, House Malister, absolutely hates Ironborn. It's the Malisters that end up escorting Theon to the sea, and Theon's ship seems to be a Malister agent. Now next we are treated to this extra scene where Joffrey asks Cersei if she committed incest. Now nothing like this is in the book, and Joffrey seems to be taking the idea that he might be a bastard born of incest pretty well. This leads to a montage of the Gold Cloaks killing various bastards around King's Landing. Now in the show it makes it look like Cersei has ordered the mass killing of children. In the book things are a lot more ambiguous. First off, only one child is killed in the book. And yes, Tyrion does suspect Cersei ordered this killing but we don't really have any evidence of it. It could have been Joffrey, or Littlefinger, or anyone else who had connections to the Gold Cloaks. Now in the show, Janus Slint does the killing, but in the book, it's the mysterious Alar Deem. Alar Deem was Janus Slint's second in command. Not only does he have a weird name, but his name appears over a dozen times in A Clash of Kings, and then again in A Storm of Swords. It's quite striking for a man who's never seen by our point of view characters. Tyrion orders that Alar Deem be sent to the Wall, and he tells his men that he wouldn't mind if Alar Deem was killed on the way. And we don't see him at the Wall, although he could have been assigned to Eastwatch by the Sea or the Shadow Tower. I do wonder if Deem is dead, or if he's going to pop up later. Anyway, our final shot is with Arya and Gendry heading to the Wall. And that's it for episode 2.1. See you in episode 2.2.